we come to this hour, knowing that it is but an hour, yet out of all the hours in this week, this is one that is set apart, an hour that is saved, an hour that is savoured. It's a time for us to recognise what gives life meaning. It's a time to honour what we most value. It's a time to celebrate our lives in all their fullness and complexity. So let us then celebrate, honour and recognise that we might fully savour this hour that we have saved. These opening words by Louise Robeck welcome all those who've gathered here on Zoom this morning to take part in our Sunday service. Welcome to regular members of the congregation, to any friends and visitors who are with us today from near and far. Also to anyone who might be listening in on the podcast or watching us on the YouTube channel later on. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name's Jane Blackhall. I've been part of this congregation for 22 years. I'm now the ministry coordinator and I've just completed my ministry training. I'll be rev in a couple of weeks. If anyone's here for the first time today, we are especially well welcoming to you. Uh, we're really glad you're with us. Please do hang around afterwards for a chat or drop us a line during the week if you'd like to, to introduce yourself. Or you might think about coming along to one of our other online activities. They're a good way to get to know people more organically, get a more rounded sense of what we're about. If you're a regular, thank you for your commitment. Thank you for showing up here once again, not just for this commitment to the community, but for your commitment to the larger aspiration, the grander project. Each of us are playing our part to build beloved community, to nudge the world towards greater justice and love. And we start that right here when we co-create this sacred space, this sense of hospitality and welcome. So whoever you are, however you are, whatever side of bed you got out of this morning, you are welcome here just as you are. I hope you find something of what you need in this time that we have specially set apart. As we always say, feel free to do what you need to do to be comfortable. It is lovely to see your faces. It helps us get a sense of our togetherness. But we know for many it will feel more comfortable to keep the camera off and that is fine. There will be various opportunities to join in as we go along, but there's no compulsion anywhere. You can quietly lurk with our blessing. This morning I am delighted to introduce Reverend Michael Allured from Golders Green Unitarians who will be preaching for us this morning on the question, so what do you believe? Michael is also the chair of our district organisation for Unitarians in London and the South East, officially the London District and Provincial Assembly of Unitarian and Free Christian Churches, the LDPA for short. So I'm going to light our chalice now, as I do each Sunday and at other times when we gather. This simple ritual connects us with Unitarians and Unitarian Universalists the world over, and it reminds us of the historic and proudly progressive religious tradition of which this little gathering is part. In this free church, we come together without creed, gathering instead around core values of justice, equality and compassion, of mutual acceptance of our diverse ways of being as we seek to connect ourselves more fully with the unfolding truths of life and of our world. We come together in shared conviction that all people deserve a voice, a voice in matters that concern them, and it's up to each of us to protect the rights of all, particularly those who, for whatever reason, have been oppressed and held in silence. We come together in the stubborn belief that community is possible and peace is more than just a dream. We commit together to affirm our actions as well as our words, the inherent worth and dignity of every being. We come together in awareness of our interdependence with all humanity and with the wider web of existence, for that too is part of what is meant by we. In this free church, we come together without creed, believing that the way we live in the world bears testament to the value of our beliefs. And we light this chalice as a beacon of hope for all who have gathered here this morning 
for all who have ever walked through our doors or come through the Zoom waiting room, for those who might yet find this spiritual home, and for those whose paths will never come our way. For all this and for all those things we dare to hope and dream, we kindle our chalice flame this day. And let's take all of those joys and concerns and let's hold them in compassion and loving kindness as we move into an extended time of prayer and reflection now. This prayer is based on some words by Cliff Reed, which in turn are based on some words by Channing. You might want to adjust your position now to get comfortable. You might want to close your eyes or soften your gaze. Perhaps there's a posture that feels more prayerful for you. Whatever works, do whatever you need to get into the right state of body and mind for us to pray together, to be fully present, as present as we can be in this sacred time and space we've co-created to be present with ourselves, with each other, and with that which is both within us and beyond us. Spirit of life, God of all love, in whom we live and move and have our being. As we turn our attention to the depths of this life, the cosmic mystery and wisdom that abides in all that is. Make your holy presence known within us and amongst us. Creator spirit, deep in our hearts and moving among the stars, we approach you with the powers and capacities you give us. We approach you whenever we invigorate our understanding by seeking the truth. Whenever we invigorate the conscience by following it, rather than our transient passion. We approach you whenever we receive a blessing gratefully, bear a trial patiently, or encounter peril and scorn with courage. Whenever we perform an unselfish deed, or lift up our hearts in adoration. We approach you whenever we resist the habits and desires that are in conflict with our highest principles. Whenever we speak or act with moral urgency or devotion to the good. So may your divinity grow strong within us. And may the religion we profess blend seamlessly with the life that we try to lead. As we take this time to reflect on the past week, let us silently give thanks for the joys and the pleasures that we have known. Moments of friendship and love and camaraderie. Experiences of wonder and delight, reassurance and relief. Bursts of playfulness, spontaneity and generosity. Feelings of achievement, creativity and flow. All those times when we felt most alive and most awake. And let us also ask for the consolation, the forgiveness and the guidance we may need as we acknowledge our sorrows and regrets. Times of loss and pain, anger and fear. Periods of uncertainty and anxious waiting. Realisation of our own weaknesses, mistakes or failings. 
awareness of missed opportunities, all those things left unsaid or undone. Those moments when we might have struggled and felt like a mess. expanding our circle of concern now let's bring to mind all those people and places and situations that are in need of our prayers right now and let's hold them in the light maybe friends or loved ones those who are closest to our heart maybe those we find more challenging where there's some kind of conflict going on Or maybe those we don't know so well, those we've only heard about on the news. Spirit of life, God of all love. As this time of prayer draws to a close, we offer up our joys and our concerns, our hopes and our fears, our beauty and our brokenness. And we call on you for insight, healing and renewal. As we look forward to the coming week, help us to live well each day and be our best selves, using our unique gifts in the service of love, justice, and peace. Amen. Time for us to sing together now. Our first hymn is Children of a Bright Tomorrow. It's sung for us by the Unitarian Music Society. The words will be up on your screen in a moment so you can join in or you might prefer just to listen. But if you do sing along, we will do our best to make sure you're all kept muted so no one will hear you.
When I say God, it is poetry by John Haynes Holmes. When I'm asked if I believe in God, I'm either impatient or amused and frequently decline to reply. All I know, all I want to know, is that I've found in my relationships with my fellow men and in my glad beholding of the universe a reality of truth, goodness and beauty and that I am trying to make my life as best as I can a dedication to this reality. When I'm in a thinking mood I try to be rigorously rational and thus not to go one step further in my thoughts and language than my reason can take me. I then become uncertain as to whether I or anyone can assert much about God and fall back content into the mood of Job. When, however, in preaching or in prayer, in some high moment of inner communion or a profound experience in life with my fellows, I feel the pulse of emotion suddenly beating in my heart and I'm lifted up as though upon some sweeping tide that is more than the sluggish current of my days. I find it easier to speak as the poets speak and cry and so many of them cry to God. But when I say God, it is poetry and not theology. Nothing that any theologian ever wrote about God has helped me much. But everything that poets have written about flowers and birds and skies and seas and the saviours of the human race and God whosoever God may be, has at one time or another reached my soul. More and more, as I grow older, I live in the lovely thought of these seers and prophets. The theologians gather dust on the shelves of my library, but the poets are stained with my fingers and blotted with my tears. I never seem so near the truth as where, when I care not what I think or believe. But only with these masters of inner vision would live forever. This reading is um, written by Carol Grace, um, a member of our congregation, who sadly um, has Parkinson's disease quite badly now and uh, is in a home. Um, but it's taken from quite a while ago when members of the congregation wrote what they believed about God and religion. And it was uh, published in this book called Kindred Pilgrim Souls. And who knows, we might be due for another one about now. Well, this is what Carol wrote. I do believe we affect God. Belief is important to me as it drives how I think, what I do, and particularly how I relate to others. It seems to me that I have to choose what I believe with care if I'm going to have integrity. I have to know myself well enough to be able to distinguish between my own desires and wishes and what I truly believe in. It seems like hard work and it is always in progress. So there is no rest, but there is joy. There is joy in loving myself and others and the world. There is holding a sense of gratitude in the sheer wealth 
of all that is around me. So far, I have not mentioned God, and it seems to me that I know nothing about this ineffable being. Indeed, I do not know if God is a being or a process. I probably go for the uh, process. God might be the sum of all the good things in the world and be increased by our love and compassion. I do believe that we affect God and the more we are in touch with the God within, the happier we will be and the more we will increase the happiness of others. Our acceptance and compassion for others may effect a universal change in the spirit of goodness. I am so lucky in my work as a psychotherapist and teacher that I am profoundly touched by the wonderful people I meet. Some have had such sad lives and it has severely hurt them and the light of the spirit is very low in them. But working with them to find their personal meaning of their lives can be rewarding. Often, I am teaching adults seeking a career change, a change of work that will bring meaning to their lives. They want to help others and relieve suffering. To work with people with such a wonderful ambition is humbling and rewarding. What I believe seems so nebulous, and yet it is a firm foundation of my life. Of course, there can be grey days when it's difficult to hold on to my beliefs, and my sceptical side tells me that I'm fooling myself. After all, you can only have to watch the news to see that there is little love in the world. That depends on the way we see things. And it is the job of the news to remind us that there is evil in the world. And hopefully we try to amend this with our care and compassion. If we hold on to pain, we hurt ourselves and others. Endeavoring to see God within encourages us to act compassionately. I might be entirely wrong about what I believe. However, that might not matter. If my belief system benefits myself and others, and I pray it does, then I am content to be foolishly wrong. Thank you, Juliet and Brian, for both of those readings. Both my favourite pieces of writing that speak to me about God and ultimate reality. Greetings, everyone. I am so pleased to, to be with you and to be sharing this service with my friend, Jane. We now come to a, a time of meditation. I'm going to share a few words to take us into the stillness. These words will be followed by a few minutes of shared silence, during which we'll have our virtual chalice, chalice on screen. The silence will come to an end with some lovely piano music. Ashokan Farewell, played by Peter Crockford. So, friends, let's each do what we need to do to get comfortable. Perhaps you'd like to put your feet flat on the floor and steady yourself. 
maybe close your eyes or gaze at the candle as these words take us into a time of meditation. Universal spirit of life, infusing the universe, God of many names, be with us now as we are with each other. We gather in a world bruised by struggle and strife to seek, discover and bring healing. We meet in our yearning for connection and wholeness with each other and with the universe. Spirit of life, universal to us all. May we be renewed in heart to keep faith. To keep faith with the golden rule that ethic of reciprocity found in the scriptures of world religions, may we affirm their wisdom. We shall love your neighbor as yourself, Judaism and Christianity. Whatever we wish that others would do to us, do so to them, Christianity. We try our best to treat others as we would wish to be treated ourselves. And you will find that this is the shortest way to benevolence, Confucianism. We should wander the world treating all creatures as we ourselves would like to be treated. Jainism. We should not behave towards others in a way which is disagreeable to oneself. This being the essence of morality, Hinduism. Universal spirit of life and love, God of many names, may this be our prayer for today.
So, what do you believe? Perhaps that's an easier question to answer than, so what do Unitarians believe? The two questions are connected because the religious tradition to which I belong, to which I have chosen to belong, is Unitarian. So when I was asked the, that question recently, so as a Unitarian, what do you believe? I struggled to give a simple and yet satisfying answer that fully articulated in all their complexity, my theological beliefs. I explained the basics of Unitarian theology, that Unitarians have their roots in the Reformation, that Unitarians see Jesus as one of many spiritual teachers, fully human and not the son of God, that Unitarians are guided in their beliefs by reason and conscience and justice and freedom, that we find meaning from many texts, both sacred and secular, and have no holy Unitarian book or revealed creed that we must follow, but that there are as many beliefs as there are Unitarians. My attempt to articulate what I believe and why I follow a Unitarian path didn't have the accessible ring of Jesus saves about it. It came across, to be honest, as a bit dry, even earnest. I wanted to share the richness, the warmth and the depth of belonging to a community where our minds were free to formulate our own theology in freedom and fellowship. Yet, like Carol Grace, whose words we heard earlier, what I believe about God and faith isn't easy to explain. It isn't easy to explain in sound bites and could even appear to be rather vague. Not least because it might be summed up as a work in progress, an evolving theology. Paul Tillich, the German Protestant theologian, defined faith as the ultimate orientation of a person's life. Orthodox Christians would think of Christianity as their ultimate orientation of their faith or concern. They'd think of Jesus, wouldn't they? Muslims would think of Allah, would revere Allah. Few Unitarians, however, would maintain that their ultimate concern in life was Unitarianism. And who would be our savior, our God? So how am I, how are we to define and live our faith? How do I, how do we understand and explain what our faith is? Is there even such a thing as faith in the Unitarian tradition, so steeped in reason where, as the Unitarian minister Stephen Ling would put it, we, the Unitarians, are a space in which people are united by values and principles, but are entirely neutral on matters of faith. I see the point Stephen's making here. To accommodate the diversity of belief, we have concentrated on values and relegated theology and faith to an entirely personal matter. And there's some truth in this position, one that he presented at a conference on Unitarian theology in Manchester a few years ago. And yet, in many ways, 
we are living our beliefs and our theology as individuals and as Unitarian communities without necessarily recognizing that this is exactly what we are doing. These words of Andrei Sakharov, the Soviet human rights campaigner speak to me. I am unable to imagine the universe and human life without some guiding principle, without a source of spiritual warmth, which is non-material and not bound by physical laws. These words for me represent a theological position about the world and our position in it. They speak of altruism, affection, love, nobility, qualities that can't be explained purely in rational ways, but which enrich the quality of our lives through the bonds that we forge. Whenever I ask my mother questions about God and how the world began, the same reply came back in her broad Dublin accent. It is a mystery we cannot comprehend. That seed planted in appreciation of the mystery and wonder of life has grown in me, looking out to sea, on hills, through books, through conversation, and in wonder at the blue sky. To drink in the wonder of life without knowing all of the answers, but simply being is what Ralph Waldo Emerson, the transcendentalist, revered. When I look at the vast expanse of sea and sky, I'm struck by the connection to the souls who have stood looking out to the sea and up to the sky over time. I stand in awe. As Emerson wrote, the highest dwells within us. As there is no screen or ceiling between our heads and the infinite heavens, so there is no bar or wall in the soul where we, the effect, cease and God, the cause, begins. I believe in the interconnectedness of all life and a universal intelligence of which we are all part. I use the word God to describe that which is greater than ourselves, but find other e expressions like spirit of the universe or spirit of life equally helpful. I drink in the wonder of the cosmos without knowing all the answers as I continue exploring and finding meaning. It's surely this connection with what we might describe as the holy and with all that is which provides the foundation for our own individual spirituality. Divinity is around us. And what of religion? I believe that in their simplest form, the essence of all the major world religions at their best provide humanity with the guiding principles, those va va values which help us to live anchored, compassionate and enriching lives. But of course, so does secular literature and science. I'm moved by the depth and beauty of mystic poets like Rumi, just as I am reading the Sermon on the Mount and 1 Corinthians 13. I find universal truths about humanity are revealed to us 
through great drama and masterpieces of world literature and the wonders of the universe revealed to us through science. Have you ever seen the fizz and color generated when sodium or potassium is dropped into water and reacts? Have you watched in wonder at the vivid colors dancing together? For mainstream religion, the ultimate concern is about what happens after our time on earth is over and whether we have lived according to God's laws as defined in those holy books. I'm interested in what happens when we die. But since I can't know, it seems to me that to be wise not to dwell on that too much and to make the best of our lives for ourselves and others in the here and now. Making the best of the here and now, reaching out in an attempt to make the world more just and more equal is at the heart of much of what Unitarians do together as individuals and as communities. In this endeavor, our beliefs, our theology are shaped by our own life experiences and our reflections on those experiences. We are stirred by the promptings of our own consciences. What feels the right thing to do? Based on what we know, and what we understand and what we can accept according to what our reason is. Maybe all we can do and all we can do together is to find a way through, a find a way through life to speak as the poets speak and cry as so many of them cry to the idea of God, not the God of theology, for that, as we have heard, may not help very much. Let's cry to each other. Carol Grace, wrote about it in Finding the God Within. She worked in Cambodia during the Vietnamese War. And there were times, she said, when her faith in anything evaporated. The hospitals were badly damaged and most of the doctors had left the country. There were two children who made a deep impression on me, she writes, as they were particularly good to each other. The girl was about six and had lost an arm and a leg. Yet psychologically, she was strong. The boy was about eight and suffered far more pain as he had been napalmed, which left him with severe scars from the burns that he received all over his body. He found life so hard that he had withdrawn, partly so that he did not have to see people wince when they looked at him. The little girl kept him company and would chatter and smile at him. He found it hard to respond to her, but it was clear that there was a real communication between them and that she managed to convey love. Although they both suffered terrible atrocities, they kept their humanity, Carol writes, and looked after each other lovingly. In what then? Do I believe? In what then do you believe? For me, faith 
is that guiding principle of human warmth in the universe. Trust in reason based on experience and conscience and hope. Yes, hope that even in the darkness of humanity, love will triumph. Amen. So it's time now for some more singing, some more singing together. Our second hymn is The Joy of Living, performed once again by the Unitarian Music Society. Feel free to sing along or just listen and enjoy and we'll do our best to make sure that you're muted so that you won't be heard singing. Just a few announcements then this morning. Thanks so much to Michael for joining us today and preaching for us. A first to preach at Kensington, I understand, which seems unbelievable. Thanks to John for co-hosting, to Brian and Juliet for giving our readings and to Peter for our lovely music. We will have virtual coffee time after the service to have a chat if you'd like. And if that's not your thing, do feel free to get in touch via email afterwards as it, I know it's harder to get to know each other during these online times. If you can bear it, we like to take a group photo after the closing music, so do stick around for that. And we'll be back next week on Zoom at 10 a.m. when Maria is taking the lead for a service marking the start of Black History Month and honouring Notting Hill Carnival and the history around that. Do feel free to share the link and tell your friends. As ever, there are a number of opportunities to connect with the congregation in the days ahead. We've got a coffee morning at half ten on Tuesday morning. Always excellent and slightly peculiar conversation. Newcomers are always welcome. Heart and Soul, our contemplative spiritual gathering this week is on the theme of unfinished business. Um, tonight and Friday at seven o'clock, that is. We are quite full this week, but I can squeeze you on if you still want to join us. 
uh, by popular demand, the Brian's Poetry Group will be back on the 5th of October, Tuesday the 5th, 7 o'clock. Details are in the Friday email. Do have a word with Brian and let him know if you're planning to come along. A uh, new venture this week. We're planning to have a Getting to Know You walk on the afternoon of the Sunday, 17th of October, 2 o'clock. Uh, this won't be a strenuous walk. It will be a, a, a friendly amble, a chance to walk and talk. Uh, so that people who have only discovered the church in recent months since we've on, been online can socialise safely. Um, the congregation very much has a life beyond Sunday mornings. We do encourage you to keep in touch during the week and drop each other a line. Let us look out for each other as best as we can. One more event on the horizon I'm particularly keen to let you know about is my ordination and valediction service that will be on Zoom at 7 o'clock on the 8th of October. Uh, I would love to have you all there to celebrate with me. I'll be sending out the details of that soon, but please save the date in the meantime. So we've just got our brief closing words and closing music now. If you can, I invite you to select Gallery View once again at this point so we can all see each other and get a sense of our community as we close. Be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Its temple, all space. Its shrine, the good heart. Its creed, all truth. Its ritual, works of love. Its profession of faith, divine living. And in the days to come, may we truly live our faith for the greater good of all. Amen.